Hello everyone, welcome to Interstitial Lung Disease Info. In this episode, I'd like to talk about sarcoidosis and use of oxygen because it's a comment I received on the channel, a really, really good question that you know might apply to other areas of interstitial lung diseases as well, not only sarcoidosis. So stay tuned if you want to, to hear more in this episode and I'll probably just cover a lot of other general things that we might do when people with sarcoidosis or other interstitial lung diseases uh, may have to go through when they are experiencing progression and they are struggling with uh, the need for oxygen. So I'll read you the comment first and then I'll go into a couple of comments uh, that I have from my side. So basically the comment uh, goes like this. Had sarcoidosis since age 24. I'm now 60, took early retirement at age 50 because it became lung fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. So two very important things to, to, to comment on in this uh, episode. Resting oxygen saturation of 93% and 88% when mobilizing. The fatigue is awful. Apart from inhalers, I get no treatment. Can anybody tell me at what stage I should get ambulatory oxygen? So again, it's a comment that has quite a lot of things uh, in it. So, so obviously, I'll try to go over a couple of thoughts that I have. So first of all, I'd like to say that sarcoidosis is just one form of interstitial lung disease. It's caused by inflammation uh, that can occur in different types of, um, in different parts of the body in different organs. It's a specific type of inflammation called granulomatous inflammation. Um, and then there are specific pathological features that will define sarcoidosis based on a biopsy, for example, uh, that can be taken from different organs affected by this condition. But that inflammation, in that specific type of inflammation in sarcoidosis, in some cases can improve on its own. In some cases, it can remain stable as a chronic inflammatory disease, or it can turn into scarring in the organs affected, and most likely it will affect the lungs. It's one of the most commonly affected organs when people suffer with sarcoidosis, although it can affect other organs as well. Now, pulmonary hypertension, because this was mentioned in, in this uh, comment, is when the pressure between the right side of the heart and the lungs, in the arteries connecting the right side of the heart and the lungs, when those pressures increase, we call that pulmonary hypertension. Normally, the pressure from the right side of the heart to the lungs, when the blood flows from that side of the heart, coming back from the body and going into the lungs to pick up oxygen, that's a low pressure system. When the uh, pressure increases, we call that pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension. Now, that can sometimes be due, due to significant lung damage because of the sarcoidosis and there's less lung tissue for the blood to go through. So naturally there's less vascular volume. So the pressure will increase because it, the blood still needs to flow through that, uh, that affected lung. Or it can sometimes be just as a complication of the sarcoid in a, a different pathological process that may ensue that will cause the pulmonary hypertension. So it can be a combined feature. And there can be also other issues that may contribute to to the pulmonary pressures increasing in sarcoidosis, to do with heart disease, to do with other, other conditions that that patient may have. But this can happen, and sarcoidosis can cause very severe lung scarring. I've seen some very, very severe cases sometimes with where the lung scar um, scan shows extensive damage, and it's it's something that's, that's sad to see, uh, especially because in some cases maybe we could prevent that if we would treat the sarcoidosis early, but in some cases it just cannot be controlled very easy, so very easily. So this is something that I would just want you to to consider if you do suffer with sarcoidosis. The first order of business I think would be to have regular checkups with your doctor to make sure that the sarcoidosis is stable, it's not progressing, or whether you would uh, require treatment based on what's going on in the lungs, what your symptoms are. And it's never an easy decision to go on treatment for sarcoidosis, but I just wanted to cover these things to make these points before I go further in this episode. Now, breathlessness can be very, very common in people who have sarcoidosis and pulmonary fibrosis of any cause. So if you've been struggling or you know someone who's struggling with pulmonary fibrosis, you know that breathlessness is one of the main symptoms. And it can be caused by a lot of things. It can be caused by the pulmonary fibrosis in itself. It can be caused by other conditions that that person might have. So maybe they are struggling with heart disease or some other issues. So obviously, it's, it's a common symptom. Now, oxygen itself does not always relate to the level of breathlessness. So this is something very important. The level of oxygen in the blood, although some, in most cases can be correlated with the degree of breathlessness, is in, may, in, may, in some situations it's not. So it's not always the best indicator to say that the fibrosis is severe because of the breathlessness or the oxygen levels are low because of the breathlessness. It's not as 
as easy to associate. So it's important to have a holistic uh, approach, a comprehensive evaluation for the causes of breathlessness if you are struggling with this, if you have pulmonary fibrosis or sarcoidosis. Now, obviously, when the oxygen levels drop on exertion, so when you're doing something, we're walking around perhaps and you have an oximeter, an oxygen probe on your finger and you're walking around a little bit. And if the levels generally drop below 90%, in, and it's a accurate reading, so this is something that I, I, I need to emphasize because sometimes people put the, the oximeter on a cold finger, they may have some nail polish, so that may not be an accurate reading. So you need to leave the oximeter in place. It should be loose, so basically it should just like pinch your finger and you just let it hang there and then you kind of let it measure for a while, at least a few seconds until the values stabilize and you're getting an accurate pulse reading and then you read the SpO2 value, that's the oxygen saturation level. If that drops below 90%, especially when you're walking around with the oximeter on, then that could be an indication that you may require an oxygen check. That doesn't automatically imply that you will need ambulatory oxygen or oxygen long term or oxygen treatment it's important to have a check, a formal check with your healthcare providers. And in different parts of the world, the arrangements will be different. Most commonly, you will have to go to a pulmonary hospital or some other uh, clinic where they do these assessments. And generally what will happen is that the healthcare providers will need to monitor or to measure your blood gas. So we cannot, in some instances, just prescribe oxygen based on the uh, finger probe breathing. The most accurate way to do that and to do it correctly is to actually measure the arterial blood gas or a more comfortable procedure is to do an earlobe blood gas if that's available in your area but it's not always available because we need to measure what is the concentration of oxygen in the blood that's actually going to your organs and we cannot measure that through a vein unfortunately because the veins are where the blood is returning from the organs to the heart so we need to get blood from an artery or capillary blood which is again something that's going to the skin tissue and we can get that sometimes from the earlobe so that's quite interesting because it's a little bit more of a uh, a bit less of a painful procedure to get that than from a radial artery puncture which can be a little bit painful but generally we go based on the blood gas to prescribe oxygen therapy because it requires a prescription now sometimes we may not have the capacity in different tar parts of the world to to use the the arterial blood gas we may not have access to a machine so in those situations we may just go off the oxygen probe reading but it's important to talk to your doctors and they will have certain criteria for prescribing oxygen and at what level depending on the readings on the oximeter but prescription of oxygen is really really tricky because we need to be careful we need to prescribe it in the right amount at the right flow rate that's necessary in your case and actually measuring these blood gases can help us prevent some complications because some people may have co2 retention and when we give them more oxygen they tend to retain more co2 so it's a complicated balance that needs to be checked uh, by your doctor preferably now that being said we need to confirm that the oxygen is low in the blood. If we've confirmed that the oxygen level is low, then we try to correct it with oxygen. Some people, especially in the early stages of oxygen need, will only require oxygen when they are walking around, when they're doing something strenuous, something that really makes them breathless and breathe heavy, use their muscles more because that's when they're consuming more oxygen. So we would only need to supplement oxygen in those situations, but that is a form of treatment. Now, obviously, as disease progresses as the condition progresses if the, maybe the fibrosis gets worse the pulmonary hypertension gets worse because pulmonary hypertension is actually a cause of very low oxygen levels on exertion so that's really important to, to note when that's the case we may sometimes need to institute long-term oxygen therapy rather than ambulatory oxygen therapy and that's when we would maybe need to use the oxygen continuously just to always keep a, a correct level of oxygen in the blood it depends, again, on your need. It's not always the same for every person. Now, the oxygen, I said that it's a form of treatment. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it can reduce the level of pulmonary, uh, the, the extent of pulmonary hypertension. The, the actual pressures can reduce if you are using oxygen correctly because our bodies have a reflex by which they constrict vessels in areas of the lungs that don't 
receive enough oxygen. So it's just something to keep in mind. It's a physiological process. It's meant to make, make the circulation through the lungs more efficient. But sometimes when we are operating with all low oxygen levels, we might actually worsen the pulmonary hypertension. And that can actually reduce your oxygen tolerance. So your, uh, sorry, your exercise tolerance. So basically, if you are trying to, to work out more, to do more, more things, to do pulmonary rehabilitation exercises for the lungs, using the oxygen when you're doing these may allow you to do a bit more. Now, it's not always the case that when we give oxygen, the breathlessness goes away. It's uh, not as common, I would say, but it can help you treat other complications. So potentially you would delay the onset of cardiac problems that may occur because your body is operating with low oxygen levels. So all of these can be good. So oxygen has a lot of benefits, especially if prescribed correctly and not in a risky way, haphazard way, where we don't check the oxygen levels at all. So I would say that if you have received a prescription for using oxygen, even though psychologically it may be quite difficult to do it, to go on the oxygen because you need to wear some cannulas, you need to carry maybe a little cylinder with you or a portable machine, it may actually help you to delay complications of your condition and maybe do a little bit more. But I'm not sure if it always will uh, cure the breathlessness, but it may help a little bit. Now, obviously, that's the oxygen therapy. I would also say that if you are struggling with sarcoidosis specifically, remember that it's an inflammatory condition. So if it's an inflammatory condition, sometimes there may be treatment to reduce that inflammation. So depending on your indication, your situation, discuss this with your doctor, they may recommend that you go on some treatment for the sarcoidosis because that may reduce the level of inflammation in the lungs and they that may actually reduce your oxygen need. Because if the lungs are very inflamed, or obviously they're not transferring oxygen from the air into your blood very efficiently, if we are treating some of that inflammation, that can actually improve your symptoms, your oxygen need, etc. In some cases though, when the sarcoidosis has turned into lung scarring, the anti-inflammatory treatments don't work anymore because it may be something called burnt out sarcoidosis. The inflammation may be gone, but it has left a scar. In those situations, we need to just monitor whether the scarring is getting worse. And if the scarring is progressive, even though there's no sign of active inflammation in the lungs, no sign of active sarcoidosis, you may still be eligible for anti-scarring, antifibrotic medications to slow down the scarring process, if that's indicated for you. So always very, very important to go to follow-ups. If you have one of these chronic conditions such as sarcoidosis, which may flare up from time to time, it's important to have regular follow-ups with your doctor. You may require uh, further imaging tests, CT scans of your chest for every now and then, or chest x-rays, or perhaps lung function tests, or other blood tests. And also remember that sarcoidosis can affect other organs of the body, like the skin, the heart, very important. So if you are struggling with a lot of palpitations, feeling like your heart's doing something funny, do tell your doctor about that, because it can sometimes be a sign of cardiac sarcoidosis. Or it could be another heart disease that's developing, especially like in this comment, the person who, who wrote the comment said that they're, they're in their 60s. So, you know, when we get to our 60s, sometimes we develop other problems, other health issues. Now, obviously, if you are struggling with palpitations, with things, your heart's doing something funny, just mention this to your doctor because they may request other further tests, maybe a Holter ECG just to monitor what your heart rhythm is doing over 24 hours. They may request a cardiac PET scan, which is a specific type of scan to measure whether there's active, to actually see whether there's active sarcoid inflammation in the heart. There's a lot of things that we can do. Always consider also besides the oxygen treatment, whether you may need pulmonary rehabilitation if you've especially been doing less and less because you were breathless. It may be that you're your muscles are losing their strength and that can make you even more breathless. It's a vicious circle that you need to try to break. Try to optimize, optimize any other treatments for your heart conditions, other medical problems that you might be suffering from, anemia, etc. Talk to your doctor, have regular checkups if you're struggling with sarcoidosis because that's the best way to keep on top of things. Your doctor may recommend certain investigations at different time points or they may just have an observational approach just to reassure you that everything is fine. And if you do need to go on oxygen, just to conclude this video, of course, psychologically, it can be difficult. I do completely understand that, but it is a form of treatment. So try to remember to work with your healthcare team to see what's the best way to have oxygen in your case, if you need it, if you really need it. And then hopefully that helps improve things for you. 
Thank you very much for listening or watching this. Hope it was helpful. If you have further questions, leave them in the comment section uh, below. I'll see you in future videos or episodes. All the best and good health.